Hi there, this session is going to look at how to use items in your sociology exams. So uh, the item is, is uh, quite prevalent across the three papers. So if you just look at paper one here, in your education section, you've got a 10 marker with an item and you've got a 30 marker with an item. And then your methods in context question also requires an item. On paper two, you have tens with items for both families and beliefs and twenties with items with families and beliefs. And then for paper three, you have, again, the same as education, a 10 with an item and a 30 with an item. And then finally, a theory and methods question, uh, 20 marker with an item as well. So really, really important skill uh, that all, nearly all of the big questions in the exam require you to use. So really vital session this. Uh, and I'm glad to say it's relatively simple. So what is the item? Well, it's a short paragraph outlining required content that frames the debate for your answer. So have a look at this example here. Your item is almost like a guiding piece for you. It's directing you towards the content that you need to use in your answer. Now, the skill, the assessment objective that's being, uh, that's partially assessed here is application. Can you apply what is in this item to the question? If you imagine you didn't have the item, it would mean that you could talk about anything to answer that question. But when you do have the item, you have to apply that material in your answer. And particularly for 10 markers where you can only apply the material from that item into your answer. With 20s and 30s, it gives you a bit more freedom. Okay, so what do we do? How do we answer uh, these questions with items then? Well, we've got three steps. Step one, we read the item and the question first. Uh, you can have a pen in your hand and you should be ready to un underline, to identify what topics are, uh, are uh, sort of triggering in your mind. Uh, and so just read them both really carefully. Sometimes the item and the question aren't as uh, closely linked as you might expect. And so it's really important to read both. Do not just read the item and then start answering. I have had students do that. They just start answering the question because the item is on the role of education. And so they just start writing about the role of education. Don't do that. Read both. Step two, identify the two or three hooks. And I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by a hook. But a hook is a concept or an idea or an argument which links to one of our peel paragraphs. And so what we're trying to do when we read the item is to identify the peel paragraphs that we're going to use. And we call those our hooks. They hook onto our peel paragraph. And then we start each of our P's from our P-E-E-A-L's. We start each of our P's with a quote from that hook to make sure that the examiner knows really clearly that we have used the item. So we're going to read them both first, step one. We're going to identify two or three hooks, two for 10 markers, three for 20s and 30s. And then we're going to start each of our P's with a quote from that hook. Okay, let's have a look at this first one. Um, I want you to pause the video and to read the item and the question. Go. Okay. So uh, immediately when you read through this, you should be able to identify the topic that we're dealing with here. So obviously we're dealing with uh, ethnic differences in education. Uh, now this is actually quite a difficult one to start with because um, as the question says here, analyze two reasons why pupils from some minority ethnic groups achieve above average results in schools. The reason why this one's a little bit trickier is because they don't actually give you any reasons why uh, particularly Chinese and Indian students perform better. They just tell you that they do. Let's work out what the hooks are that we can use. So first of all, we've got Chinese and Indian pupils. Now, from your knowledge, you will know that Chinese and Indian pupils are the top attaining students. And you should hopefully know a few of the reasons for this. Uh, we've got family attitudes towards education. There is a strong cultural focus in both Indian households and Chinese households uh, towards succeeding in education and moving on uh, through the steps in education up to university. And so this trickles down into attitudes of the students. Um, Secondly, you could talk about positive labelling. We know Archer's research talks about um, Asian students having the pathologised pupil identity. So that could be kind of on the one hand. However, they don't have the demonised pupil identity of the white working class and black students. And so maybe that's one particular reason why they might do better because of positive labelling. Uh, 
Okay, so those would be some of the possible peel paragraphs you could talk about there. And the second hook is this point here. Chinese pupils on free school meals do better than white pupils who are not on free school meals. And so what this is really directing you towards is saying not material deprivation, because uh, white students on, who are not on free school meals are doing worse. So poor, uh, richer white kids are doing worse than poorer Chinese kids in sort of simple language. Uh, and so what this is directing you towards would be, again, that home environment. So the culture at home for Chinese students focusing on education, focusing on discipline. Uh, and you could talk a little bit here about uh, the ambition then of uh, recent immigrant groups to try and use education uh, to further themselves and to, to uh, develop their understanding and skills, whereas white students may be less likely to do this and they might be more, more likely to join anti-school subcultures, um, for example. So two hooks there, that's quite a tricky one, but two hooks that we would use and we would then quote Chinese and Indian pupils and Chinese pupils and free school mills do better than white pupils, we would quote that at the start of each P and we would write our paragraph out. Uh, this one's slightly easier, so read item A and answer the question that follows. Um, this you'll, you'll just quickly notice this one is actually cut and paste from an exam paper. I've written this out myself. This is exactly how it will look. I've just tried to mimic it. So again, pause the video please and read the item and the question. Okay, thank you. And immediately you should identify the topic that this is coming from. So this is obviously families and um, childhood. Uh, and again, this one, this one is uh, well. This is a little bit less tricky, but uh, this is a, a really important thing to point out. Sometimes our items are actually not all helpful, so it's worth actually just reading through this item together now to identify what's helpful and what isn't. So, if our question is to analyse two arguments against the view that childhood is a fixed universal stage. Let's read through the item and work out what is actually helpful. A popular view is that childhood is a fixed universal biological stage of physical and psychological immaturity that is common to all human beings. Well, because we want two arguments against that view, that is not a helpful sentence for us, right? We cannot actually quote that and use it. So let's try the second one. Everyone will pass through it on the way to biological maturity and adulthood. Again, that is supporting that statement and we need arguments against it. So again, not useful. However, evidence shows that what counts as childhood, hook number one, what experiences undergo and what roles they play are far from universal. So they've actually given us three hooks in one sentence at the end. Let's just examine those specifically. Evidence shows that what counts as childhood, so this is talking about different cultures arguing that childhood comes at different points. We obviously have a very child-centred society where we believe that childhood is a golden age. This is a very modern idea. And so the idea of what actually counts as a child is a very, we have a very modern Western idea of this special moment, this, this special period where you have to keep the children pure. That's not the way it works in other countries, particularly in developing countries where children are often put to work. You can talk here about Aries's study of the past, uh, particularly looking at that Peter Bruegel painting of medieval England where children are indistinguishable from adults. What experiences undergo, so the uh, again this is linked to the previous one, but children and adults have different experiences uh, in our society. However, across the world this varies across different cultures. So we, again, have a very westernised experience of childhood being very distinct from work, for example, whereas they may experience work in a different culture. And what roles they play are far from universal. Uh, and so here we could talk about um, anything from the childhood topic, really. You could talk about toxicity, so the idea that uh, children are now involved in uh, in the reversal of what's been happening, so they are now being uh, shown far more uh, adult material via the internet, um, and you could start to analyse that by looking at the information hierarchy, and so maybe children's roles are actually shifting and changing rather than being fixed. Okay, so here's another one. Uh, same deal here, please. I want you to read through, identify the topic, and then see if you can identify the hooks this time. 
Okay, so um, we're obviously in families still. We're looking at the role of the family. And as we track through, there's a nice simple technique here. We can see that word, capital M, sticking out Marxist. So as soon as we see that, we know that there's a hook. If you ever see functionalist, Marxist, action theorist, positivist, interpretivist, postmodernist, uh, interactionist, if you see those terms, that is a hook. That means you can talk about those people and what they say about the topic of the question. So if this question is evaluate the claim that the family is a positive force, well, because they've given us that word, we know that we can dive into the negatives that Marxists outline. So that's our first beautiful hook. And even though it becomes it comes after what you might think is the first hook, I thought it's worth mentioning. If you see that, that is a freebie. OK, positive force. Now, positive force is used in the question. You need to make sure in your answer you talk about this specifically. So quote it and write about it. Obviously, this is the functionalist perspective. This is Parsons. This is Murdoch. So that is our second hook. A flexible workforce. Now, that is specifically um, Parsons again. So that is directing you towards another Peel paragraph that you can hook onto and use. And there's actually four that you can pick up from this item. The personal life perspective, similar to what I just said about Marxist functionists, all those uh, theoretical perspectives. That means you can now talk about the personal life perspective and the idea that we need to look at the family from the bottom up rather, from, rather than from the top down. OK, uh, another one here. Have a read through and see if you can identify the hooks. This is a 30 marker. Go. All right. And uh, again, hopefully nice and simply, you should see straight away you've got Durkheim right there. And so that's going to suggest to you that we need we need functionalism. They actually give us the title of one of our appeals. So if we're going to evaluate the claim that the education system serves the needs of the economy or teaching the skills is one of our appeal paragraphs that we practice and that we use. And so that's obviously one of our hooks. We need to quote that one in one of our paragraphs. A positive process, again, we would quote that at the start of another one of our paragraphs in our 30 marker and discuss why functionalists think it's positive, role allocation, meritocracy, etc. Uh, Marxists argue this process is negative, obviously, so that now leads us into all of our Marxist arguments and we can talk about all of them. We don't need to be limited, but we need to show that we have applied this item to our question. Now, with a 30 marker and a 20 marker, you don't have to stick just to the item. You can talk about everything in that whole topic as long as it's linked to the question. So even though this question doesn't talk about Willis... We can still talk about Willis because Willis has things to say about the education system serving the needs of your economy. The clue is actually in the question. It says applying material from item A and your knowledge. So you have to apply the question on this one, but you can also apply your knowledge. Just to quickly pop back to the 10 marker, you'll notice, look at the question again. Applying material from item A, analyse two reasons why pupils from some minority ethnic groups so there is no and your knowledge here. You must apply this item in your answer. If you talked in your answer about black Caribbean boys, you'll just get zero marks. If you talk about girls, you'll just get zero marks. What this needs you to talk about is Chinese and Indian students doing better than average. OK, um, so hopefully that was helpful. Uh, and it's worth saying that once you get the item uh, the technique for the item down, it's really, really powerful and easy. And actually what most students say by the end of year 13 is that the item becomes a really helpful clue and a really helpful jog of their memory. Uh, so again, hope that was helpful. Thanks for listening.